Welcome to Soapbox. I'm your host tonight, James Israel. Uh, tonight I get to utter words I never thought I would, which is that I'm going to be interviewing a Pulitzer Prize winner on television. I've only been doing this show for a couple months, so before this I never thought I'd even be on television, much less interviewing a Pulitzer Prize winner. But it is my honor tonight to uh, have Mr. Jack Oman, who is a Pulitzer Prize winning editorial cartoonist for the Sacramento Bee. Before we get to Jack, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our sponsors. Uh, we've got pizzas, uh, Pieces Pizza by the Slice, including low-fat, vegetarian, and gluten-free options, as well as a fine selection of beer, wine, and soft drinks. We thank them for keeping us fueled here by supplying pizza for the crew. They are at 1309 21st Street, Sacramento, 916-441-1949. Also, the Humor Times. It bills itself as the world's funniest news source. The monthly political humor magazine is available worldwide by subscription in print or digital format. Their motto is, don't cry about the news, laugh about it with the Humor Times. Cartoons, funny fake news, videos, and more can be found at humortimes.com. And full disclosure, I uh, happen to be the editor and founder of the Humor Times, and so it's uh, especially fun for me tonight to be interviewing a, an editorial cartoonist, which is one of our main contents, um, uh, types of content in the paper is uh, editorial cartoons. And uh, so, Jack Goman, thanks for coming. Good Welcome. to see you. It's good to see you. So you won the Pulitzer Prize. Did you ever think that uh, that you were in in uh, in line for that, or how did how did that come about? Well, you think you're in line for it, and then you <laughs> wait 38 years. So um, you know it's a hard it's it's a difficult road to get there. And uh, you know I'd spent my entire career, you know, trying to get there. And uh, there were moments when in my career where I thought. Uh, you know, I had a stronger portfolio than other years, but I happened to hit the Powerball this year. Mm -hmm. And it's a very tough process. You have to go through a jury level first, and there's five people on the jury, and then it goes up to the board, and I think there's nine or eleven people on the board. So, How do you even get considered? Do they come <coughs> to you? Do they approach you? Or do you well, submit? always beware of somebody who says they're nominated for the Pulitzer Prize because you can nominate yourself for the Pulitzer Prize oh. with $75 in the oh, okay. entry <laughs> thing. But if I was a finalist in 2012, and mm. so I had, you know, won virtually every other national award prior to this, mm. and so I was cautiously optimistic that I would win it. But I didn't. You can never, you know. It's like I would really like to pitch for the Yankees. Uh -huh. I would love to pitch for the Yankees. Right. But so, yeah. <laughs> but it's like this has been like going through a wormhole, and, and just it's shocking. You think you're in play for it, and then it actually happens, and it's almost completely different than uh -huh. whatever you thought it would be. Right. Is uh, would you consider it like the top award that you could win in in your field? Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. Um, I want to win a Heisman. That's my next. <laughs> you know. For sure. Uh, you mentioned some of your other honors. Uh, I have some listed here. The Robert F. Kennedy Journalism Award, the Scripps Howard Foundation Journalism Award. Which they discontinued right after I won it. Oh, really? So you were <laughs> yeah. the last one, huh? Yep. Got in there under right. the wire. Uh, and the National Society of Professional Journalists Award. Mm -hmm. Were there more? Or are these just the, the top, there are more. top ones? There are more, yeah. Um, well, great. It's, uh, it's really nice to have you here. Um, I'd like to talk about the art of cartooning, how you come up with your ideas and so on. But I did want to um, show the folks at home some of the cartoons that won you the prize. Uh, this, these were part of your portfolio, mm -hmm. portfolio mm -hmm. which was submitted, what, the middle of last year or so? No, we, we submitted in January. January. Mm -hmm. So these cartoons are all from before that? The, uh, 2015. Okay, mm -hmm. so this one um, um, was probably right after the Hebdo, Charlie Hebdo, Charlie Hebdo, thing. Hebdo yeah. right? Uh, Ferguson, um, the new GOP, uh, 
and the establishment GOP there not liking it much. They still don't. This one I love. You know, I got a funny phone call or email from somebody who was a, a sonogram technician, and she said, you know, I love this cartoon, but, like, we don't have two paddles. We just have one. <laughs> she, it was like a defibrillator. Yeah, right. You know, so anyway, when the bullets are for, you know, basically yeah. a mistake. But, but wouldn't that give you a stereo image then? <laughs> I, 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 I went on the Internet to see if there were, you know, two paddle sonograms, uh -huh. but I didn't find any, so oh, okay. I guess she was right. So moving on there. Uh, this is uh, relevant to California. We had five drought cartoons in there. That was kind of a subset of the of the entry. Okay. So uh, yeah, those uh, were just some of the cartoons they they looked at when they decided to give you the award. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the way, I just wanted to quote them. Uh, the Pulitzer Citation called your cartoon uh, or said that your cartoons. You draw cartoons that convey wry, rueful perspectives through a sophisticated style that combines bold line work with subtle colors and textures. Um, and this prize was just announced, what, a few weeks ago, right? April 18th. April 18th. Um, and I've noticed that about your cartoons, too. You have a very unique style with the, with the bold lines and the, the you. colors you choose and everything. Um, you know, it's funny that Photoshop has just changed everything in right. cartooning, and I worked exclusively in black and white until about six or seven years ago, maybe, and I had the hardest time with Photoshop. Oh, my God. It was, I, I just couldn't get the hang of it. And then um, a couple of years ago, I figured out, this is so arcane, but there were a couple <laughs> new tools that somebody showed me, and nobody uh -huh. seems to be working this way. So um, I was able to develop a fairly unique, illustration style, uh -huh. fortunately. Okay, yeah. Uh, well, you know, having done the, car, uh, the Humor Times for 25 years, um, you know, all the cartoons used to come in the mail, Yep. snail mail, uh, all just black and white photocopies, and, um, <clears throat> you know, we would shrink those down and put them up on the light table, all old school, nothing was digital at all. Yeah, it was and terrible. Cartoons yeah. didn't, the editorial cartoons didn't start adding color until, like you say, just a few years yeah. ago. And now pretty much they're all doing it. Well, what's interesting now is when I see my cartoons in black and white, it surprises me. Uh -huh. It's like, why didn't you, where's the color? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah, well, we still uh, print, uh, you know, old school newsprint, and um, mm -hmm. a lot of the pages are black and white. Um, I prefer to work in black and white, actually. I think you can really separate out some artists from other artists by how well they can do that. It's right. very difficult to, do, yeah. to get that kind of three-dimensional look where you've got the solid blacks and the whites and the crosshatch. Mm -hmm. and, um, but I still like, I do a, you know, an actual old school pen and ink drawing and then I just scan it in. But right. um, sometimes it, you have to be a little sensitive to your, the color needs. So there are things that I won't do now in the, in the background. But, so Photoshop make, can either improve your work or make you incredibly lazy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, with the cartoons we print, um, there's only a few artists that supply the, the black and white line drawing that has no grays. It's just, like you say, long line drawing with the cross hatches, as well as the color. And I really like it when they do that, because being that we do print a lot of it in black and white, I, I really appreciate that mm -hmm. art form rather than using the grays. and. Mm -hmm. So on, um, but I think it's really interesting. Well, I mean, how cartoonists that's evolved, evolved. were so um, influenced by Jeff McNally and Pat Oliphant forty mm -hmm. years ago, thirty-five years ago, and or, <laughs> I can't believe it was forty years ago. But, <laughs> um, but they were both using something called Duo Shade, which was a, 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 a type of illustration board that had two different liquids that and apparently was a you know, saline-based liquid uh, or paper, and the one liquid would bring up these light-colored lines, and then the darker liquid would give you a crosshatch line. Oh, so they were masters at this, and so all, all the other cartoonists immediately jumped on this, and then um, uh, a lot of cartoonists got tired of the look, and so mostly people stopped using it. And so now it's the company's gone out of business, and, mm. and cartoonists were basically the only people buying that paper. Right, right. Uh, well, this you is the most uh, arcane cartoon conversation I've had in <laughs> years, decades. Well, you're and speaking to an editor, right. so. Uh, 
Well, um, you, you brought up some of the uh, old cartoonists. Who were who were your like your original inspirations? What made you want to get into editorial cartooning? Was it Oliphant and those guys? Well, I, I didn't want to go into cartooning. I mean, that's that's the interesting thing. What did I you want, do? What well, kind of art did you do? Well, I wasn't interested in art particularly. Okay. Right. I wanted to go into politics, and okay. so I worked in politics in the late seventies. Uh, I was born in 1960, so um, the 1976 election, I was an aide to a, a guy who was running for the legislature, who it was his first term. And then in 1978, um, I had just graduated from high school, and I had, was working as a driver, an advance man for a congressional candidate in Minnesota. And so um, it's terrible work. I mean, it's really difficult, boring a lot of the time, and driving all over southern Minnesota and thunderstorms and I just thought oh, I don't want to do this for a living I mean mm -hmm. I, I, you know being a candidate is one thing but being an aide is mm -hmm. a very different personality type sure. so I needed a way to put myself through school and so a friend of mine's mother was the dean at the University of Minnesota in general college and she saw that there was an ad in the Minnesota Daily for a political cartoonist and Steve Sack had just left the Daily to go down to the Fort Wayne paper. Mm -hmm. And so I got an interview, and I had been drawing uh, all, you know, through my high school years. I mean, I could always draw, and I was always drawing little cartoons and doing parodies and writing. I was very influenced by uh, the National Lampoon in particular, Mad Magazine, The New Yorker, um, James Thurber. And, um, and I, I thought of myself almost as more of a writer, mm -hmm. and um, I loved doing parodies. And so I had quite a lot of work to show them when I went in for this interview. And so they interviewed 40 people. Hmm. And I, was, I got the job. And the reason I got the job was th their big trick question was, who is William F. Buckley? So I, I was up against 39 art students, right? Oh, okay. And so, but I would, I'd watch Firing Line every Saturday and, and it was, you know, had read several of Buckley's books and read National Review. I wasn't that I was conservative, but I was one of the many things that I was reading. Mm -hmm. So that got me in the door at the Minnesota Daily. Hmm. Interesting. They wanted to make sure their cartoonists had a good political Well, I, I, yeah, I had actually worked in politics and was majoring in political science. I was not an art major. Well, you know, nothing wrong with that. I mean, right. I wish I had majored in art now. <laughs> but, uh, um, but So I had only worked at the Minnesota Daily for a couple of weeks, and I realized, wow, I really enjoy this. And so um, I thought, maybe I can make a go of it. And within a year, um, uh, about a year, the first cartoon I ever sent to Newsweek they, was reprinted. So I was 19. I mean, if you think of the 19-year-olds that you know in your life. Right. But I was like very organized and, you know, mm -hmm. just in cartooning and completely disorganized otherwise. <laughs> but, um, so that was, uh, then I started getting reprinted in the Washington Post. And so between that and Newsweek, I started to get attention from other newspaper editors. So then I was running the New York Times and I got picked up for syndication um, by Copley News Service, and then I got, uh, then went over to the, um, what was then, you know, for the Chicago Tribune Syndicate. This, they've had about five names since I'm, I've been with them. Mm -hmm. So I was syndicated just before I turned 20. Wow, that's impressive. So now that first publication you worked for again, what was it? The Minnesota Daily. Minnesota Daily, now mm -hmm. that, that was a? Student paper at the University oh, okay. of Minnesota. Uh, you've also drawn for the Oregonian, mm -hmm. Detroit Free Press, Columbus Dispatch in Ohio. Are mm -hmm. those the like the main dailies yeah, that you worked my, for? Yeah, the Dispatch was, at the time, um, it would be the um, you know the main paper in Columbus, and then I was there for 53 weeks, <laughs> and, and then I went up to the Detroit Free Press, and at that time. The, the circulation was about 635,000, and now they're down to about 250,000, mm -hmm. and they don't deliver every day. I mean, it's a completely different yeah. environment now. Yeah, it is. And I went out to the Oregonian when I, I had just gotten married. My ex-wife was from Oregon, and mm -hmm. so she wanted to go out there, and, and I enjoyed it. I had a great experience there. Mm -hmm. um, and then, I mean, I don't know how far you, deeply you want to go into this, but, you know, Rex Babin was my best friend, and right, he was cartoonist for the... For the for the B mm -hmm. and um, uh, it was I, I mean it was the, the traumatic horrible experience for any everybody who loved him and so I came down here a number of times when he was very ill 
and I got to know a couple of the editors here. And um, I mean, if you've never met this man, I mean, he was magnificent, I mean, in every way. I mean, ethically, he was a very handsome guy, he was very athletic, very outgoing. And, and um, after he died, they asked me if I was interested in coming down. Yeah, I regret that I never did uh, meet him when he was here. Um, but that's very interesting. Um, you brought up um, the, the kind of the decline in numbers of uh, the dailies. Um, that really has put a crimp on the budget that they've had for editorial cartoonists as well as, of course, writers, journalists of all sorts. And it's really bringing up a crisis now in the media. How do you pay people when you know, everyone wants to see everything for free on the internet. Um, cartoons, editorial cartoons are all over the internet. Um, so how do you employ people? How do, you know, um, and I, I'm sure it's gotten much harder to get good paying jobs for journalists of all kinds, including editorial cartoonists. So you wanna speak a little bit sure. about that? Sure, well, in, when I started in cartooning um, in 1980 uh, in syndication, there were probably <clears throat> 225 full-time editorial cartoonists working on daily newspapers in the United States. And uh, I was just last year president of the Association of American Editorial Cartoonists. We have fewer than 50 mm -hmm. full-time. Mm -hmm. I believe there's only two in California wow. and one in Texas full-time. Right. So uh, I think the people who are hanging on are doing well. Um, but there was a huge flush out ten, you know, starting about 10 years ago. And so when I came here, um, I don't just do cartoons. You know, I'll, I do five cartoons a week. I write a Sunday column, uh, <laughs> you know, which, for example, uh, was featured at the top of the Drudge Report um, mm -hmm. this morning. And yeah. so I had hundreds of emails on my yeah. column, all of which, you know, were horrible. <laughs> and, um, but, and then I write editorials from time to time. I mean, you know, it was kind of averaging one a week prior to the Pulitzer. Um, and then I make videos for the B. So I'm trying to create content across all the platforms. Yeah. So I think that that's why I've been able to survive in political right. cartooning. Right. Um, I was going to ask you about your writing. Um, I, I haven't I keep seen answering all your questions. Yeah, I know. Before, before you I, ask them. That's fine, though. Um, but I haven't seen any of your writing, and I looked, I hunted around on the B. I, I know you're, you do a, an alter ego thing with a fictional California politician named Joe King. Yeah, I mean, if you, you happen to dig one up, and you could put it on the show and just find a 60-second one or something. But... Uh, I pretend to be uh, at first a gubernatorial candidate and then a, a U.S. Senate candidate named Joe King. And so we're, we make fake commercials and we put them out oh, in the okay. community. And the, a couple months ago, we did one with Gavin Newsom where he's giving Joe King, you know, style hints. And, uh, uh -huh. so, and it's been fun. So yeah. as I said, I try to stay flexible within the medium. Definitely would like to see that. Um, so the, the Joe King thing is that um, you write columns under that name? Or no, 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 no. I write a column on Sunday under okay. my own name and then, but Joe King is a video thing. It's a video thing. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and are those available on the SACB uh -huh. website? Yeah, they're on YouTube. If you just Google on check YouTube. Joe okay. King, Sacramento Bee. Yeah, I wish I'd done that. We yeah. could have shown one of, one of your little clips on, uh, on the show today. Well, um, great. I'll definitely look that up. Um, and then, so you write editorials as well once in a while. Mm -hmm. Are they... Do you try to be humorous or are they serious? Depending. I mean, I've written everything from uh, uh, rodenticides to mm -hmm. uh, Memorial Day, uh, you know, holiday editorials. I've written several Christmas editorials. I mean, I kind of have a, this very fortuitous position as kind of the light essayist on the staff. So I can do whatever I want, but I've written speeches about foreign policy or editorials about foreign policy. Uh, all sorts of topics. Okay. Um, well, we do have more of your more recent cartoons. You want to take sure. a look at those and maybe talk about them a little bit. Um, a lot on Trump these days, right. of course. Well, I, I, I find, 
am, am I allowed to be political? Y yes. Well, I mean, this is actually this, supposed to be a political show. I see. Uh, well, show, uh, yeah. <laughs> Bill, the, the, if you would have told me a year ago that Donald Trump would be the Republican nominee, uh, yeah. I, I'm just astounded by yeah, it. I, I think everyone uh, is. And so, I'm, what I'm really astounded by is that he's the nominee of the Republican Party, yeah. which ostensibly is all about family values. And, it's mind-boggling. It's, it's mind-boggling, and that the amazing. suspension of disbelief that yeah. the Republican electorate has undergone in order to nominate this man. And, and the amount of fundamentalist Christian types that go for him is... I, that's like, it's like a alternate universe or something. You know, It's like the, the mirror universe of you know, yeah, what you would the expect. the bad mirror universe, yeah. right. <laughs> like the fourth universe, you know. Yeah, it's incredible, yeah. really. Uh, and then this is. Um, I really like this. This one. is about uh, kind of the Hillary Clinton's um, ability to con connect with millennials or lack right, of right. same. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, I view the this Clintons. This was during the, the primaries, New Hampshire and Iowa. Right, and I, I view Hillary and Bill as almost artifacts from my generation mm -hmm. when they were nominated or she he was nominated in 92 and I was in my early 30s and it was all you know I wasn't a, I've never been a huge Bill Clinton fan I mean I admire his skill set mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, uh, and uh, you know I think that she's absolutely the most qualified candidate in this race and yeah. she's you know a highly credible candidate but I mean if she would be my first choice I thought no but I I mean in this field she is yeah um, I had thought that we had gone past the Clinton era when right. Obama was nominated. And well, at, uh, at the beginning, it was gonna, it was looking like it would be Clinton versus Bush. Right. You know, talk about which is yeah, talk about time warp, right? Um, right. You killed out Bush as the nominee now. You know? uh, this one I like a lot. Uh, you're showing both <laughs> Bernie and uh, and Clinton. And this was one that, uh, you know, I love drawing them as a couple. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and um, the, is, but of course there were um, 74 year olds who were very upset by the way I would portray Bernie and, um, <laughs> you know, but I'm to the age now where I can't see the buttons on my remote either, so I have <laughs> quite a bit of empathy for them. Yeah. Here's yet another um, Hillary trying to connect with young people right. uh, at a cartoon. And, uh, you know, the, the Clintons are, very much artifacts of the 60s and um, they, uh, you know, for well or ill. Oh, and, I just noticed um, this. That's supposed to be Bill in the back? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even notice that and, before. Uh, so uh, th this, this is, they are the last gasp of that generation. Right. And, um, you know, with all due respect, uh, I, I think, you know, they're, they're, they've got an amazing skill set. There's no question about it. I mean, the, their survivability is, is astounding. It would be like Nixon still running right now, right, you know. Right. Um, so. Well, they are the, uh, like the quintessential politicians, you know. I mean, they, they really got it down to an art form. Well, he's astounding. Yeah. You know, no matter what you think about him politically, he has yeah. an amazing ability to campaign. Right. And she has an amazing ability to memorize policy minutia uh -huh. and but I, I, I've met her and it's funny uh, she's very uh, her, her, her public campaign style when she's speaking is I would call it average at best but when you meet her in person she's astounding one-on-one -on -one. Mm -hmm. and, and within the same time period like a week I also met Barack Obama where his public campaigning style is like it's like watching JFK or Franklin Roosevelt I mean he's like that good right and then in person he's quite my experience with him was that he was a bit awkward mm -hmm. it wasn't like his first skill set mm -hmm. making small talk mm -hmm. she was amazing at it I mean mm -hmm. she shook my hand and she said oh you people do such important work you know <laughs> and well thank you you know um, <laughs> So they're 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 an astounding story. Yeah, um, I was hoping to get keep going there. I, I was hoping to get to uh, well that one I really like. Thanks. Size matters. Uh, yeah, and then I, I noticed ever since that size thing came out, every time you draw um, Trump, he's got teeny Me, tiny little they're hands. Increasingly smaller. <laughs> it's so funny. Uh, keep going. There's there's one I want to get to. Oh, this one's good. 
open carry. Oh my God, I can't imagine what's going to happen. Uh, is that actually going to happen? They're going to have open carry? No, they, they said that they're not oh, going okay. to. Yeah. Fasc the fascinating aspect to that this is one's that... This hilarious. Thank you. Um, <laughs> There's this tiny, tiny right, little hands. Right, right. <laughs> what's interesting to me is that they're... You know, Trump said yes or, at the NRA rally that... Um, I th or not at the... He gave this rousing pro-gun speech and then... He said, it, it turns out that all the Trump properties are, are gun-free zones. So oh, yeah. but it's okay mm -hmm. to have guns right. on school grounds and armed right. teachers, but not at the well, Trump and properties. That seems to be true with the NRA as well, you know. I don't think they allow guns at their meetings uh, and so you, on. You know, they, they right. want guns to be available everywhere else. Um, we're we're kind of starting to wrap up here. I, I wanted to um, get this, make sure I get this question in. So, okay. Um, I'm going to ask a question that uh, I'm paraphrasing my hero of TV interviewing, which was Mr. Stephen Colbert on his old Colbert show. Uh, so Donald Trump likes to talk about himself and how great he thinks he is, right? So my question is, is Donald Trump a great gift to political humorists and cartoonists or the greatest gift ever? Well... I mean, I view him as a national catastrophe. I mean, so that was I, actually going to be my, my well, next phrase. Well, I, I mean, it's hard for me to separate my feelings as a, a satirist and yeah. artist, and, and my feelings as a citizen. Right. And so, to me, I, I like working with more subtle figures. I think that that's uh, more difficult. Mm -hmm. I mean, it mm -hmm. brings out my skill set better. Sure. Um, Everything about Trump is so over the top that it's it's like mere illustration. Right. It's not like you're satirizing him. It's almost yeah. like you're toning him down in a cartoon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the, the, you you watch him just with you know pure incredulousness. Yeah, he's almost like a parody of himself. He is self-parodying. I mean, yeah. the system has become kind of self-parodying in some ways. Um, so, uh, you know, is he the greatest gift to satire? Not really. Um, but I'm hoping this all. Winds up. Well, thanks, soon. Jack, for coming. Uh, we're going to be signing off. But, uh, thank Pleasure, you so James. Much. Good it's to see really, you. Really good to Thanks have you. a lot. Yeah.